Okay, let's get started. So, um, as you heard, my name is Pavan Divakarla. Um, I'm the data and analytics business leader. For, the, for those of you, if the W gets you sort of confused, it's actually a V, so it's V plus Avan Pavan. So hopefully uh, now you know how to pronounce my name. Um, so I am the data and analytics business leader, and what that sort of means uh, sort of in sort of common lingo is it's sort of a combination of a chief data officer and a chief analytics officer. So I work a lot with the data folks, data governance, and so on to get the data right. And then I work a lot uh, closely with advanced analytics and data scientist folks to actually innovate on data sets that we have. Uh, sort of in, in sort of more real world terms, it feels a bit more like we're counting a lot of the data, which is sort of the CDO side of the things. And then we're sort of playing with it, which is sort of more the innovation sides of things. So this is sort of how I visualize this in, in, in my head, sort of a combination between Count and Bert and Ernie. Um, a few things about me. Uh, obviously, I spend a lot of time at Progressive uh, playing with data, talking about data, you know, trying to free the data so more people can actually access this data and use the data, because sometimes historically, you can actually amass a lot of data, but if it's not accessible, what uses it? So, and then as a company, we actually do have a lot of reverence for data, and we'll get, to, get into that in a second. Um, as I mentioned, I work at Progressive. Here's a view of our campus. Uh, we're in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, and it's very Google-esque, so it's not something what you may expect of an insurance company, but it's, it truly does feel like Google. We have a big campus lots of woods, uh, lots of places to go run, and uh, you know, just be outside and, and so on. And so that's sort of more of the insurance on the outside, but it actually truly is Google on the inside. Um, it's an awesome place to work. Um, we've had all various types of awards uh, around you know, one of the best companies to work in Northeast Ohio. Um, I'm gonna play an ad. It sort of kind of describes our sort of uh, how we approach our business and how we approach our customers and sort of how we sort of live uh, on a day-to-day -day basis uh, in, um, at Progressive. What does an apron have to do with car insurance? An apron is hard work. An apron is pride in what you do. An apron is not quitting until you've made something a little better. What does an apron have to do with car insurance? For us, everything. So, you know, the apron metaphor for us in the space of data and analytics is all about trying to get the right data, get the right tools, work hard with it, make it accessible, useful, and also make it available so that we can build interesting user experiences offer our sort of insured and our future customers. So that's basically our goal, is to sort of really uh, sort of get behind data and use it. Um, so like I mentioned, uh, you know, data is sort of part and parcel of what we do. If you come into a meeting, you're basically expected to bring some form of data to the meeting, some sort of analysis and so on. Everything is backed by a lot of data at Progressive. We've got a good rigor for that. And we treat big data no differently. It's really data is big data. It's sort of the same thing for us. We do have separate infrastructures, but it basically is the same thing. It's sort of big data sort of like baked in for us at Progressive. And where sort of our work relies is truly in the work of segmentation, right? That's, that's at the end of the day, the holy grail for us is segmentation. How do we actually segment our current customers, future customers, any piece of data that we have, the goal really is segmentation, constantly, constantly trying to segment the data. And that's basically what we do on, on a daily basis. It is just a framework though, you know, so this is how we sort of look at the data. And I have one sort of interesting uh, uh, example here of someone talking about a framework. So this is uh, Dilbert who gets asked, well, you know, what do you do for a living? He answers, you know, he's working on a framework for uh, you know, allowing uh, construction of large-scale analytical queries on unstructured data, right? So we really want to amass this data set and actually do analytics on top of it. But it is just a framework for us, you know? So this is not like big data is separate or something unstructured data is separate. We basically keep everything together and uh, kind of use it to provide rich experiences for our customers. 
But d data is just not enough, as you all know, and that's why we're here at this conference. It's all about the algorithms, right? So we really need to pair the data that we collect and organize with the right sort of algorithms. And that's where we like H2O, we like a lot of other sort of uh, algorithms uh, or tools that provide these algorithms for us on a daily basis. And as I mentioned, you know, we do have a reverence for data, which means that we treat the data really well, we take care of it, and we want to get it organized so that our folks can use it. And on top of that, you know, since we are in the insurance business, it is about predictive models. So the fact that we need to think about predictive models is sort of not lost on us. It is what we do, and that's what we do. And that's where H2O comes into our picture. Lots of different use cases at Progressive, as you can imagine. Uh, any big uh, sort of consumer-oriented uh, company, you know, we have finance, billing, and so on. Obviously, big use cases there. Marketing, customer retention, pro, you know, churn, and those type of data sets. Uh, fraud mitigation. Obviously, insurance has a lot of fraud in it, so we want to make sure we organize that and uh, sort of use uh, tools to predict fraud uh, and so on. Claims management, again, a place where we actually spend a lot of our money. That's where how we, you know, money goes out. Uh, we want to make sure we manage our claims appropriately. And then telematics. And we'll get into a little bit of telematics with uh, Brian's section, so he'll talk to you about how we organize our usage-based data and what we do with it. So in order to enable all this, what sort of infrastructure do we, do we want to put together? And so I'll just quickly walk you through the components of the infrastructure. So the way we look at it, and it's very similar to maybe the slide that we saw from Transamerica uh, earlier, it's, it's we sort of basically have a data storage layer we have, where we have a variety of tools and systems that we use, like I'm pointing out here, DB2, SQL Server, Hadoop, and an appliance. So we basically, inter we have an interplay across all these different systems. Um, we use R, where obviously no other, every insurance company does use SaaS, so we have SaaS. We pair those with H2O so we can actually have a robust predictive modeling sort of um, toolkit. We sort of get into more sophisticated algorithms beyond just GLM and so on, so we do a lot of more machine learning. And then we end up communicating and visualizing and sharing the data using various different tools, such as Tableau and D3 and so on. So that basically is our stack. This is how we sort of get things done on a daily basis. Uh, there's a few more components in here, but I think you get the general essence of what we try to do. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next part of this presentation, and Brian's going to share with us some interesting telematics data, how we manage it, how we organize it, and what are some pitfalls in managing data sets such as those, and uh, how we get it ready for our data scientists to work on. Brian? Thank you. So this is going to be a little bit different than a lot of what you've seen so far at this conference. Uh, I am not a data scientist. I'm an engineer. I've got a strong SQL background. And what I want to show is um, what we do with vehicle telematics data, how we analyze it, how we process it, how we visualize it and understand what that is. And so to talk about that, we have our snapshot offering. And what snapshot is, it's a way that we can customize and tune an individual driver's insurance rate based on how they drive. So we'll take a device, such as this one here, we'll send it to a customer in the mail, they'll plug it into their car, we'll track the driving behavior over a 90-day period or so, and based on how they drive, we'll adjust the insurance rate, either up or down based on how well they drive. So that's the general model that we have in place today. I'll talk a little bit about what we see with this data and how we deal with it. The devices have changed over the years. So way back in 1998, they looked like this. It's like a big, huge box. You had to get it wired in your car. It was permanently wired in there. You had to have your mechanic go and do it. And uh, you know, hard to kind of deal with that. But it evolved over time to these devices that you could plug into the diagnostic port in your vehicle. And so this particular device, you could take a, you could take it out of the car or you could run a cable into the vehicle itself and upload the data to Progressive from your PC. So cooked up to the PC via that port to get the data to Progressive. We changed that in 2008 when we started using cell phone networks. So instead of sending the data over your PC's connection with this device, it automatically talked over the cell phone networks as you're driving or at the completion of one of your trips after you've driven. 
In 2010, our marketing guys got a little bit more involved here and they kind of rebranded it. It's the same general functionality, just looks a little shinier, a little different. And in 2014, we added these orange stripes on the side, which means uh, there's, there's actually, it, it means something. So these are the ones that have a GPS chip inside of them. So back in 2008 here, or 2010, there was no GPS. It was just speed of the vehicle and a time of the day of the vehicle. It's basically all we were collecting from there. And in 2014, we started sampling GPS data from a subset of our devices. So we can start to track location, which tells us a lot about driving behavior. It's not part of our production scoring model today. It's just for research purposes, but it uh, gives us some pretty good insights. 2015, uh, it might actually bleed into 2016, we're gonna release a program with General Motors uh, as part of their OnStar program, where your driving data can be sent with your permission to Progressive we will score it, and then based on that, we can offer you a discounted rate with Progressive Insurance if you're not a current Progressive customer. So it's kind of an interesting model here, working with the auto OEMs. Uh, it's just one of the, the current agreements that we have. And in 2016, we're gonna roll out our smartphone version of Snapshot. There's no device at all, you don't plug anything in your car, you just run the application on your very own smartphone, Android or Apple, and uh, based on that, we track driving behavior and we can adjust your rates accordingly. So, before Snapshot, before all this telematic stuff, what did we know about our customers and how they drove? Well, we didn't know very much at all. Uh, basically, all we knew was this. We knew the year, make, and model of the vehicle, which tells you a little bit. Um, you know, there's a different rate associated with a Ferrari than with uh, the Chevrolet, but it doesn't tell you how the person is driving the car, how are they treating that vehicle. Um, so we introduced Snapshot, and this is the model we have in place today. We track a couple different variables here. Uh, the key ones being speed of the vehicle and time. So this is a chart that's playing out for one trip of one driver. It shows time across the bottom and speed along the side. So you can see this one trip playing over and over again of the speed of the vehicle as time progresses. And you can do some interesting things with that. Uh, one of the first things that we started doing here is looking at speed bands. So for how long is a given customer traveling at a certain rate? If you're traveling at 75 miles per hour for an extended period of time, that's a lot different driving behavior than traveling at 25 miles per hour. So that's very predictive, interesting information. And the bands that you see here are sort of arbitrary for this example. The real bands are, are something a little bit different than that. You also look at time bands. So at what time of day, what day of week are you driving? If you're driving on a Sunday morning, that's a lot different than driving late Saturday night. Uh, maybe you're driving in rush hour, right? There's different risks associated with these things. So this concept of time bands is actually pretty powerful. We use that as well. The next thing we did after that was introduced um, the concept of hard braking events. Each one of these circles here represents where our customer slow down in their vehicle faster than we think is maybe a safe rate. And this can be due to a lot of different things. Uh, but mainly we think that they weren't necessarily paying attention to what was going on around them. And if you have to slow down fast, this heartbreaking event occurs, and maybe you're not uh, driving as safely as we like. So we'll count up the number of hard brakes that occur on each trip, and we'll get an average number of hard brakes for all of your trips, and then we'll compare that and say, okay, compared to other drivers that have less frequent accidents or less severe, how does their number of hard brakes compare to yours? And that tells us a lot as well. The next thing that we did here is we introduced this audible tone. And so you'll hear it when a hard brake occurs. Does anybody like that noise? It's really annoying. It's, it's pretty terrible. So, but there's, there's value in having this. Um, when those audible tones go off, People don't like it, and I know when I'm driving and the device beeps at me, my wife is yelling at me because I'm costing us more money on our insurance policy. Um, but there's, there's, a, there's a lot of value in this because we see over a two week period there's a significant behavioral modification on how people drive because nobody likes hearing that beep. And because they don't like hearing that, they change their driving behavior. And another interesting piece of this is the people that have the audible tones in the devices versus those that don't, they actually pay about 5% less on their insurance policy with us. So there's real monetary value and it's, um, there's value in having something like this. 
Okay, so where are we going next? Uh, as I said, we started collecting GPS data, and so what you can do with that is you can start to take that one trip and you can plot it out geographically on a map now. So here's the same trip laid out here, and you can put it in context. So here's a trip in Cleveland for uh, one specific drive. This is my driving data. And now you can look at the speed of the vehicle at various locations. And so given that, um, you can put things in context like where do hard brakes occur? The red lines are where hard brakes occur. Hard brakes at an intersection are much different than hard brakes uh, on the freeway. You can look at accident data. Here's a heat map of accident data and where those occur. So if you have speeding and hard brakes in a high accident area, we'll score that differently. You can also go back and look at what these routes look like. So thank you, Google, for providing something like this. They're street view cars. We can actually look at where this route was and where this person was driving and kind of get a feel for the, the type of road that they were on. Uh, did it have an HOV lane? Was it um, a one-way street? You can look at that sort of stuff. So is this big data? Yes, we have lots of trips. Uh, trip starts when you start your car and it stops when you turn it off. We got about two billion of those. Lots of data records closing in on two trillion data records. So we'll sample at one hertz. Uh, we get a lot of data here. The red is the data we get off of the OBD devices. The purple little sliver up there is the GPS data we just started collecting. And uh, that's gonna grow substantially. And we passed 14 billion miles. So it's a lot of data. Try to put it in context here. How much is 14 billion miles? Does anybody know what this one is? One of the Voyager probes launched in the 70s, one of the fastest man-made objects ever. It's been going for 30 some years. And we just surpassed the number of miles with snapshot um, relative to what Voyager traveled. So that was kind of a neat thing, neat stat there. Uh, our technology, so cars, talk to the OBD devices, which get data from the GPS satellites. Take that in the cell phone network into Progressive, where we will score it. We'll store it in various systems, a, a database system, a big parallel database system, and, and also Hadoop. And we'll report back over the internet a score to our customers. And so we use a whole bunch of other technologies in order to analyze that data and score it. Uh, we can talk in a lot of detail about all this stuff if you want to come talk to me afterwards. And we visualize it. So we do a lot of data exploration experiments to try to figure out what data is really useful and how do we want to use it. And so we use D3, we use Tableau, and we use Excel here and there. Two main users are our analysts and our data scientists. Analysts wear the glasses, scientists wear the pocket protectors. And our analysts' two main responsibilities are our device is happy and our customer's happy. So our customer's happy with the service we're providing and are the devices working as we expect them to. Uh, we also want to make sure that we have the right inventory. We don't want one of these little devices in the warehouse and we don't want 500,000. We want just the right amount. Kristen's one of our analysts. This is what her desk looked like. So she does a whole bunch of stuff like programming these and updating the firmware of these devices. And she also produces interesting things like um, these charts which show the amount of data that we collect per year, make, model, vehicle. Each one of these rectangles represents a different year, make, model, vehicle, and so you can kind of get a feel for the type of data we collect. Uh, and you can do things like this. This is the number of hard breaks by year, make, model. So the bigger the rectangle, the more miles we've collected, the more data, and the color represents the count of hard breaks for that specific type of car. It's pretty easy to see that, hey, there's a problem with the Mitsubishis. So we're able to work with Mitsubishi to identify the problem and do something about it. Uh, this visualization tools in our big data sets allows us to do this, which we didn't have access to previously. The other thing we do is look at voltage fluctuations. Each one of the circles represents a different individual customer, and the size of the circle represents the number of voltage fluctuations in the car. And so some things stand out. And what we've determined is if we measure a lot of voltage fluctuations in the vehicle here, like these big circles, it means your alternator is about to die. And so this isn't something that Progressive did. It's not their, our device that's doing it. Uh, it's they had a problem with their alternator. We can detect that now. And now we proactively reach out and we call these customers and we say, hey, you might want to take your car to mechanics. Something bad might be about to happen. We don't want you to get stranded somewhere. And at first we thought it'd be kind of a weird big brother thing. And we didn't know what the overall reception would be, but it's been very positive. So good results on things like that. Data scientists, um, Edward has, uh, well, Edward's one of our data scientists. They want to make sure the algorithm is accurate, our scoring algorithm, and how can we improve it? So thinking outside the box, new ideas, what data sets can we leverage, what data sets can we add into our existing systems, 
and how can we produce better models. So this is Edward. He was supposed to be here today, uh, but was unable to make it. He's doing an experiment here where he's exploring different data sets and figuring out um, heartbreaking versus traffic data and looking at weather on one side and trying to figure out if there's a correlation here and is this useful or not. So this is every snapshot trip that we've ever collected on a, a map. It's not a map of the United States, it's a map of our data, it just happens to look like the United States. Uh, red is where we have high volume, blue is where we have low volume. And something interesting here is happening. You see all these data points in the water, right? We don't offer snapshot for our boat insurance line, so what's going on there? Uh, a couple things can cause this. Mountains, obstructions to the GPS satellites. So if you're standing next to a mountain or driving next to it, the satellite signal can't get through or it gets bounced around and it changes the timing, so that's an issue. Uh, or when you're here, right? Down between these buildings, these tall urban canyons, this also obstructs the GPS data and makes it hard to get good reads on it. So the first one. Every snapshot trip here, first thing we can do is just clean them up. Let's identify those straight points. And so if you were traveling along on a road on, um, and we're measuring GPS once per second, and all of a sudden there's a point 10 miles away, and then the points after that are right back in line, we can pretty easily discard those. So we'll do that. It gets a little bit better that way. But what does GPS quality look like? So this is a map of quality of the data. Blue is good, high quality. Red is low quality. And so why might it look like this? You see red in a couple different areas here. Uh, at first we thought maybe it had to do with mountains, right? Elevation, altitude changes. And so here is the average altitude of these locations as reported by our GPS devices. Red is high, blue is low. And if you kind of do a quality comparison versus the altitude, you can kind of see, eh, it doesn't quite line up that well. It's, it's okay. And just a visual difference here representing the difference between those two data sets. Uh, if you have those dark areas, that means there's uh, good alignment. The bright areas are where it's not. If you plot out quality versus altitude, it doesn't really tell you much of anything. It's kind of like this big scatter plot of where we just have customers. So that wasn't totally useful. The other thing you look at is variance in altitude. How much does the altitude change in a given area? So that's what this represents. These red dots, the red areas, represent where the altitude or elevation changes a lot within a given area. And so those are the locations where you're gonna have obstructions to the GPS satellites from our devices. And comparing that versus quality, you get a little bit better of alignment. The visuals comparison here shows a little bit better results. And plotting out quality versus variance, it starts to get a little bit tighter. Still not good enough for a lot of our purposes, but we're, we're heading in the right direction. So the other thing we look at is what happens in the cities, the urban areas. Uh, any guesses what something like this is? Looks like something my kids drew. It's like hanging on my refrigerator. This is, um, these are each individual trips. This is the raw GPS data plotted out for individual trips from our customers. And so when you sort of put this in context on the map, you can see, okay, this is a city and I see people are driving through buildings and all sorts of crazy stuff going on here. That's actually the Washington State Convention Center. And so the reason why the data might look like that is there's a big freeway that goes right underneath the convention center. And when it does that, all the data gets jumbled around and it starts to look like this. So we have to be smart about how we account for things like that in our models. We need to clean it up so we're providing the right result to our customers. At the macro level in Seattle, it, it's not much better. So blue is good. Blue is high quality, red is low quality. And there's all sorts of crazy stuff going on here. Like, who's this person driving out in the water? Anybody you know what that is? There's a ferry, right. There's a ferry that goes out to Bainbridge Island. Somebody parked their car in the ferry, left it on, and so the OBD device is saying the wheels aren't turning. GPS is telling us a different story. So there's lots of interesting things that you have to take into account when you're scoring this type of data. Here's one trip. They're gonna get on the I-5, they're gonna head south. It's pretty easy to see when they go underneath that convention center. Uh, again, blue's high quality, red's low quality, and there it is. The signal just completely drops out, and they jump like a block or two over. So plot of that same trip, quality, you can see where it dips down. Um, and to prove that this isn't just like this huge horror story that's unsolvable, we can fix it. Uh, so our data science team works pretty hard on making sure that we have the right algorithms in place to account for all this noisy data. And so here you see the raw data before, 
and after our team has a chance to apply their data cleaning, data munging algorithms to it, you can see how clean it gets. So we want to make sure that the data that we're using and how we're dealing with the customer data is as accurate as possible. So um, I know I have one minute left. I'm going to go quickly here. Las Vegas, this is all the trips for one night. It's kind of neat to see. It's kind of organic seeing these people drive around. And uh, just looking at it as a whole, you can see um, the blue areas are where we have a little bit of data, and the red are where we have a lot of data. Uh, we can also look at quality, and you can see people like driving out into the desert. It's kind of neat to watch this. And there's quality issues right in the middle. So if anybody's been to Las Vegas, they can probably guess why something like this happens. It's the strip, right? These tall buildings right there where we have these quality issues because those signals get bounced around in there. Out in the desert, it's, it's a bit better. So lessons learned from dealing with this big data set, this big messy data. Data's awesome. Messy data is also very useful. It can tell you a lot about uh, your customer behavior. And it can tell you a lot about what tools and approaches you need to solve some of this data. And visualization technology allows you to analyze it to really understand are the, um, the approaches that you're taking to solve some of the data integrity issues, are they working or not? So does your, your map matching algorithm work effectively or not? It's hard just looking at the raw data. Using visualization tools like I showed you help us analyze that more effectively. So just one more thing I want to show. Uh, this is the total amount in discounts we've given out per state since we started Snapshot. And it's a big deal, right? So that's, you know, closing in half a billion dollars there. Uh, this isn't just like this little science experiment that Progress is doing. It's a big deal to progressive customers, and that's why we make sure we're scoring the data as accurately as we possibly can, because it is significant. Um, with that, I think I have a couple minutes for questions, and of course, like any other companies here, we are hiring to good data scientists. I'm taking the first one. So uh, what's the average savings per customer? Average savings per customer, I think, is somewhere between 10 and 20%. Yeah, uh, it was nice to see the savings, uh, but I imagine there's an opposite slide that shows how much you have increased costs for those drivers that were bad. Do you have any numbers on that? Well, so this is the, the total number taking into account savings and the surcharge. The previous model that we had up until not too long ago was discount only, so only a discount. But there's some really bad drivers out there, and we want to give them the surcharge so that we can appropriately price their policy. And um, I do have numbers about that. I don't think it's a number I can share. Um, but we tend to see those sort of customers aren't very happy with us, and they leave and go to our competitors, and that's great. Other questions? Anyone? Oh, we got one in the back. Are there any concerns with only sampling for 90 days that you're going to have people that are trying to game the system? So, for example, taking a bus for 90 days and parking your car and only taking it to the grocery store at once a week instead yeah. of driving so it to work. 90 days gives us the first indication of the discount. We actually leave the device in the car for six months, and we track it over six months. So that's what the snapshot part is, actually six months duration. 90 days gives you the first preview of how it's doing. And I think the data shows that we are creatures of habit. I mean, there's many other research papers that have been put together on this that says that you know, within 14, 15 days, you actually reach some sort of steady state. You may have the odd trips here and there, but there's a lot of data that has this sort of, that tells us that there's a steady state. For us, we put it for six months in, um, because you know, we, it's a lot of, it's fairly expensive to leave the device in the car and constantly transmitting. So six months actually gives us a fairly decent view of, uh, of the behavior. Yes, there's probably some gaming, and that's where tools like H2O and such come into play. Is, you know, how do you identify gamers versus not, et cetera. You know? So there's a, the there's a, there's a whole science of, in, behind this of trying to figure out what is true, what is not true, and so on. It's a good question. Hi. Um, yeah, thanks for the great presentation. I have a question about telemetrics. So the snapshot sends data immediately through uh, cellular, uh, cellular signal. Um, do, can you describe uh, like real-time aspects of telemetrics, like use cases? 
Uh, I think the question is, um, can you talk about real time and streaming? And, uh, so mm -hmm. the way our product is currently constructed is we only collect the data at the completion of a trip. And so we deal with noisy data and bad cell reception if we're trying to stream the data as the car's moving and driving. So what we actually start doing is we start recording the data when you start your trip. At the end of the trip, when you turn off the car, at that point in time, we upload the data to Progressive. So we don't have to deal with uh, the streaming data aspect um, as the car's moving. That might change in our smartphone version of Snapshot, where we're not dealing with the, uh, the custom hardware that we manufacture. And so that model might change a little bit uh, in something we're investigating now. But I, I guess I can't talk in a lot of detail about it. Yeah. Um, so how do you deal with uh, people who share vehicles? Um, like for instance, maybe I'm a bad driver, my husband's a good driver. Uh, do, do you get that kind of a thing? Or, and how, how would you detect that? Uh, our, so our current model is the device is tied to the vehicle. vehicle. So it's a per vehicle type discount. And who's ever driving that vehicle, we're just going to score that behavior. It gets a little bit more interesting when you have uh, the smartphone version of this, because uh, maybe you are in the car with your, your husband, and so you both are running the application, and so who's actually driving, how do you score that? Uh, so vehicle to driver alignment gets a lot more interesting when you're talking about measuring on a smartphone, and so there's definitely some interesting business scenarios there that you have to yeah. work through. But today it's tied to a, a vehicle for our, our custom hardware. Uh, just a quick question. What constitutes uh, a good driver, or how? <laughs> wow. Is this a competitor that's asking the question? <laughs> Who's asking? I can't see. Um, why don't you come talk to me afterwards? <laughs> do, do we have any other questions? All right, so let's okay. thank our speakers.